hello guys and welcome to my video so today is a very special day and we're focusing on the october november 2018 question paper 224 physics the question paper is one hour 15 minutes long and we're going to go in depth explaining how this question was supposed to be worked out with interactive and easy to understand um examples that can be able to help you uh, pass a level physics so if you like my content please like and subscribe so let's begin Okay, starting off with uh, number one, the first question, we're given a golfer. So golfer, a person, uh, a person who plays golf, is put with this little white ball, right? So they have a golf ball, um, and it's streaking so that it leaves the horizontal ground with a velocity of six meters per second. Okay, at an angle theta to the horizontal, um, as shown here. The magnitude of the initial um, vertical component VI of the velocity is 4.8. Assume that air resistance is negligible. Show that the magnitude of the initial horizontal component uh, VX is 3.6. Okay, so I want you guys to look at this, right? If you look at this, this is actually just a triangle, right? It's a triangle that's like this, right? Essentially, because we have the hypotenuse, right? And we have the adjacent side, and then we have everything all together so this is our triangle right the six here is your hypotenuse uh, the four here is this side and then the vx will be this side right so if we were to take it on the side and put it over here um you can clearly see that um we can first find so we have two methods right and we're just going to discuss them um a little bit so that you know you know uh, both of these methods and how they can be used to solve uh this kind of question so the first method right uh, method one is using something that this guy came up with pythagoras very important guy um so he came up with this law that if you have c and then you have a and then you have b in order to find c uh c squared will be equal to a squared plus b squared so c squared will be equal to a squared plus uh b squared so in this case our c is six so um essentially six squared would be equal to our a is 4.8 squared plus our b squared so b will be equal to the square root of 6 squared minus 4.8 squared then we get a value of b of 3.6 meters per second right so essentially that will be uh, the value of b that we're going to find so that's the first method right so we've shown that the magnitude is 3.6 by using something pythagoras came up with the second method that you could use is just use basic trig relationships right so what you know so this is method one we can go for method two you know if you want to be fancy right depends what method do you think is the best that can help you solve um this this specific question okay so if we were to look at this have this specific angle theta okay and then uh, here we have six and then here we have 4.8 so this is the opposite then this is the hypotenuse so we basically know that um sine theta okay would be equal to the opposite side that you have divided by the hypotenuse right that's basically how you find uh, sine theta divided by the hypotenuse and if you look at our opposite our opposite is um sorry this is six right um six is the uh, hypotenuse and then 4.8 um, is the opposite so our opposite is actually uh 4.8 then our hypotenuse is six so it means that our theta would just be arc sine of 4.8 divided by six okay so the value of theta would just be 53.133 then so forth and so forth but you also know that cos theta okay is equal to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse okay so it means that the adjacent in this case which is b which is essentially what we want to find um the adjacent right will be equal to cos theta times your hypotenuse which is six so this would just be six cos uh 53.13 and then this should also give you uh, 3.6 meters per second. So you can choose whatever method you want as long as you arrive at the answer that is essentially what uh, what matters the most. Okay, uh, moving on to question B. The ball leaves the ground at a time t is goes to zero and reaches its maximum height 
at our t is equals to 0 0.49 so if we go back to our question if we go back to our question here the boy is going to leave the ground okay it's going to travel it's going to travel it's going to travel and then it's going to reach a maximum height right then um if after he's the maximum height the time is actually 0 0.49 uh, uh seconds so we just want to sketch we just want to sketch right so the easiest one that you can always start with we, on these sketch questions is usually the horizontal component it rarely changes it just remains constant right so if we were to start here we have three here this would be uh so this is two uh four okay so this would be um so basically if you look at this this would be 3.2 3.4 3.6 right and we basically just want 3.6 so it will be somewhere here right and then if you look at this if it's gonna reach if you have a bow right let's uh no we can't keep on going back let's just put our surface here okay like this if you have a ball that rises and reaches maximum height and it takes 0 0.49 seconds assuming everything remains constant it's going to return back to the same height which is the base here so it's going to take the exact same amount of time so overall it's going to take 0 0.98 right because if it's going to take 0 0.49 uh, seconds for this part is going to take 0 0.49 seconds for the other part and if you say 0 0.49 plus 0 0.49 that's going to give you 0 0.98 so essentially it's just going to be a straight line that reaches 0 0.98 which is somewhere here right so we just need a straight line that's going to reach uh, this specific point okay so so we're starting here um then we go then we reach here okay so uh, from here to here that's basically it and the question said guys label just follow what they're doing right just label x okay um you know there's no point in you not not labeling to be honest like so so what are they looking for well cambridge um is very specific it's looking number one because there's two marks here guys there's two marks um for this one number one they're looking for a horizontal line okay so your line just has to be horizontal and you get your mark right number two it has to start at zero and 3.6 where it is started from 0 0.3.6 then it's supposed to end at 0 0.98 as well as you know 3.6 and we have made made sure that those um those two requirements are met okay now going on to the vertical uh, vy so for the vertical we're starting off at um at 3.6 um sorry at 4.8 right because if you look at this right the initial vertical one is actually 4.8 over there so that is the one that we're starting with when t is equal to zero so it will be at 4.8 so 4.0 4.2 4.4 4.6 4.8 so basically at this point then we're going to reach the maximum height at 0 0.49 that's a very very important clear distinction at 0 0.49 we're going to reach the maximum height and at the maximum height if you look at this the vertical velocity when you're here at the maximum height vertical velocity will actually be zero there will be no vertical velocity because your body will almost be stationary right so if you have 0 0.42 uh 44 46 48 49 somewhere here okay and then at the bottom since it's it started off with 4.8 it's gonna end up with 4.8 but in the opposite direction so we're gonna have uh 4.8 here just in the opposite direction right just directed downwards okay so we're gonna have negative uh 4.8 that would be over here remember our 0 0.98 we're still maintaining it right um so basically 0 0.98 is over here so this was supposed to um be here so just go to 0 0.98 okay so 0 0.98 is essentially uh this point okay this point we go with it and then negative 4.8 essentially is this coordinate okay what's left just draw your, your vertical line why because the acceleration is constant so your line has to uh sort of be you know the same okay so you draw a line that start from here passes through there yeah that's it and then you get your mark okay doable pretty doable right and make sure it doesn't do what what my line is doing here it's 
is it starts and ends at this specific coordinate. So you must, it, it will be easy for you because you have an actual sharp pencil. Always make sure that the line is very, very sharp. As Cambridge expects, they need a straight line for the first mark that passes through 0 and 4.8, uh, and then it goes through 0 0.490. And then it must continue with the same gradient up until negative 4.8 and 0 0.98. Then you get your second mark and label it Y. Guys, you lose nothing just by labeling, right? Label it Y. Okay. Calculate the maximum height reached by the bow. Calculate the maximum height reached by the bow. Choose whatever you want. But we're going to use a very, very special method created by this guy, say Isaac Newton. Very, very important guy. Uh, lived in the 16th century. Came up with some pretty pretty important laws so we're gonna just sort of steal one of his laws and use them right um so we know that v squared is equal to uh u squared plus 2as okay and we know that vy uh squared in the y because that's where we have acceleration will be equal to ui squared plus 2as the final velocity at the top will be zero like we have said okay initial velocity 4.8 all of that squared minus because the acceleration will be acting downwards and if up is positive since this velocity ui is positive it means that down will be negative so this will be 2 times 9.81 times s right so it means that 2 times 9.81 times s will be equal to 4.8 all of that squared okay so your s will be equal to 4.8 squared uh, divided by 2 times 9.81 what does this give you something about 1.17 um, you know 1.17769.05 so essentially if you want to be fancy 2SF why because the least number of significant figures that we have from UI is actually 2SF so basically means that our uncertainty should also have 2SF right that has to make sense so we have 1.2 meters so your maximum height 1.2 meters okay moving on for the movement of the ball from the ground to its maximum height uh, determine the ratio of the kinetic energy at the maximum height to the change in gra uh, gravitational potential energy okay what are we going to do what are we going to do let's see right first start off with what you know what do you know right i know that ek okay is equivalent to one half m uh, v squared okay at the maximum height the only velocity that i have is the velocity in the what in the horizontal okay so it means that ek will be equal to one half m do i have the mass of this ball do you know how much this golf ball weighs unless you pay a golf you might but if you're like me you won't even know right um at the, so at the maximum height the only velocity that we have is actually the vertical velocity which is actually 3.6 uh, if you look at it so we're gonna have times times 3.6 um all of that squared so this is basically going to be um uh, 3 point six squared uh, so that by a half is going to be 6.48 uh, meters right so basically this is our ek right our kinetic energy okay and then if you go to gpe okay gpe um gravitational potential energy it's just m uh, g times delta h okay so your m do you have it again you don't 9.81 times your delta h i advise you i highly highly advise you guys to use the exact answer that you have calculated from the previous question right then you just round off the um the final answer you could use rounded off figures it's still possible because it's a carried figure um from the top but i always try to use the actual answer that i would have calculated you know it's a bit much easier and yeah it, it just avoids a lot of complications so i'd one pin um one seven you know uh seven seven and so forth right so it means that if i'm gonna find a specific ratio right if i'm gonna say ek okay divided by my gpe right that's just going to be my ek is 6.48 meters divided by my gpe which is m times 9.81 times 1.177 the m and m cancel out then if you divide that you're just going to have 0 0.5 uh, 6 4 5 7 and so forth and so forth 
so your answer will be 0 0.56 okay so highly advise that you just use the exact answer that sort of saves a lot of complications and makes the whole process much easier so your ratio will just be 0 0.56 okay in practice there actually is some air resistance huh so they lie to us right this was theoretical okay i'm um, explain why the actual time taken for the ball to reach maximum height is actually less get this it's less than the time calculated when the air resistance is assumed to be negligible so in practice there's actually significant air resistance right um air resistance actually acts um on this specific ball so if you have a ball like so um like so this is our golf uh golf ball okay two forces are going to be acting on this thing um the first one is actually due to its weight um this will be its weight and the new addition to this will be air resistance acting up okay and then we have air resistance that will be acting up so we have two forces air resistance and the weight that will be acting as the ball um, will be going up okay right so we have the weight that's acting down but look at this air resistance does one thing and one thing it's best it's good at opposition i don't like that guy right it only opposes motion okay so if this boy is going to go up and up and up so it probably means that air resistance is going to oppose that and say no i'm going to act down right so air resistance will just be acting downwards so that's the direction of air resistance and if you think about this both now air resistance and weight are decelerating this golf ball so this golf ball is going to move very very fast uh downwards right so the acceleration is going to decrease because um so, oh, sorry the deceleration itself is going to increase so it's going to decelerate at a very very fast pace because there's a greater resultant force because if you think about this the whole point of it reaching a maximum height is that its velocity is gone where the velocity is zero so if there's going to be air resistance and weight pulling the objects down it's going to reach zero very quickly now the maximum height doesn't matter the question never said the maximum height is equal the maximum height might actually be a lesser height but the whole point is it has to reach its maximum height so the time is going to be less why let's explain that because there uh, with air resistance okay um with air resistance the uh, resultant force is larger they can just give you the same mark right but this is you know me just being a little bit extra i'm um, all of this but you know the the essence is if the resultant force is larger there's going to be a greater deceleration that will be acting down as the force due to air resistance actually acts in the opposite direction to the velocity as if there's a greater deceleration which means that it's going to take less time to reach its maximum height or for its velocity to actually reach zero Moving on, question two. The kilogram, meter, and second, um, you know, are SI base units. State the two other base units. Well, this is just um, one for current, which is the ampere. And then the, um, the other one is the Kelvin, named after the famous Lord Kelvin, discovered this unit. Very, very neat guy, right? So it's going to be the Kelvin. Uh, B. We have a uniform beam AB of length 6 uh, placed on a horizontal surface and then tilted at an angle of 31 degrees to the horizontal as shown. The beam is held in equilibrium by four forces. State and name the force X. Well, if this thing was left, as you can see from the demonstration that I've put on the screen, um, if this thing is left to fall, okay, if you look at a book that's inclined at an angle and if it's left to fall, it's sort of going to slide backwards, right? What, what they assume that you have tried this and you've seen that this actually works right <laughs> and as i said x has to be a frictional force because the whole point is if the book is moving backwards hence uh, the force of friction will be acting in the opposite direction right to oppose um the motion of this object so x just has to be the frictional force okay so x um will be uh the frictional uh, force or just the force uh, due to friction okay by taking moments about and b calculate the weight w of the beam okay what do we know we know that uh the summation of the anti-clockwise moments will be equal to the summation of the clockwise moments okay so we just need to find anti-clockwise moments 
then find the clockwise moments then we're done so if you're starting at b the whole point is to say that you need a distance that is perpendicular guys you either resolve the distance or you resolve the force so if you start with that point at point a it's it's very evident that um if you look at this our force is acting in this direction okay we can easily see that anyone can see that right and since our force is edge in this direction you have the force which is 90 times the distance which is 6 and this is acting in a clockwise direction right that's clockwise okay so for the clockwise direction we're going to have uh, 90 okay 90 times 6.0 so it's 90 times 6.0 then for the anti-clockwise now um, we're gonna look at something very very uh, very tricky right if you look at this we have a force uh we have a force w okay now so if you now if you look at the other one you have a force w that's acting down so we just need to resolve w so it will be acting so we just need the component of w that's acting in this direction okay because if you have the component of w in this direction we can easily then find the resulting force because it's the product of the distance and the uh, the force right they should be perpendicular to each other so you can easily see that the weight has to act at the center so we're already done with the distance the distance has to be 3.0 because the weight has to act at the center so the distance has to be three times w we need a component of w in this direction now i want you guys to be a little cryptic here if you have if we have 31 degrees here right physics is about problem solving so you know just solving a bunch of problems so if we have uh, 31 degrees here if i were to do this okay like so if you remember your math this forms a z angle if there's 31 here there will be 31 on this other z okay and then if there's 31 that is present here you can easily agree with me that if there's 31 this angle is going to be 59 okay okay but this is 90 degrees right so if there's 59 here there's going to also be 31 here so it means that this component this is the adjacent this is the hypotenuse w and then this is the adjacent so it means that w cos 31 will be equal to that component uh, w so here we have w cos of 31 so our w will just be equal to 90 times 6.0 divided by 3 cos of 31 so the value of my weight w will just be um 209.9940 which will just be essentially 210 um newtons okay so my value of w will just be 210 uh, newtons okay what is cambridge looking for they're looking for a correct answer you get a mark they're looking for uh the working itself then you get another mark so two marks um one mark is for the working and then if you give them an answer they give you a mark give them a correct working they give you another mark a compensatory mark okay um determine the value of uh the force x okay so we have a force x here the frictional force and that is essentially just what we want to find okay so in order for us to find the force x let's remove all of this stuff and let's focus on finding the the force x so i, I want you to think of this guys we have 90 degrees that is present over there okay so if you look at it this 90 degrees can be resolved get this right why, why are we resolving it well, we're looking for a component of the 90 degrees that can help me right be able to find um you know this force x because this one acting down will counteract with this one acting up then if i resolve this so i can possibly have a component like so okay a component like so right and then i can have another component like so which will be here so i can have two components for 90 this 90 here so i basically just need this angle theta but if you look at this if i have 31 look at our big z angle guys come on so this angle will be 31 degrees okay and since this is 90 degrees well this angle 
is just going to be uh, 90 here. So this angle is just going to be 59, right? Uh, 59, like so. So we have 90, which is our hypotenuse. Then we have 59, um, which will sort of be acting here. Then we have a horizontal force that will be there. Then we have a vertical force that will be there. So it means that this component, right? This component in the X is supposed to counteract this component going forth in the X so that this thing is actually in equilibrium all right, together. So it means that if I have a 90 here, okay um if i have a 90 here and i have said i have a 31 here a 31 there then if you look at this this is actually um 59 it means that for me to be able to find this um this vertical that will be here right is just going to be 90 cos okay 90 because this is the adjacent okay because here i have 90 this is the adjacent this is 59 degrees so i'm gonna have my adjacent being 90 cos of 59 okay so you know again i repeat i first had this 90 degrees and i'm resolving to two directions one direction is here one direction is here and i want to find this angle theta that this 90 degrees makes with the horizontal so i said this is a z angle 31 here 31 there but this is a 90 degree so 90 minus 31 is 59 but this is the adjacent of this angle right we have 90 we have the adjacent so this will be 90 cos uh 59 so it means that my value of x will just be simply x will be equal to 90 cos 59 so the value of x will simply be 46 guys 46 newtons if we round it off to 2sf okay Move on question number three state the principle of conservation of momentum very very important principle that you're supposed to know well what does the principle say it says that the sum okay so the principle is pretty simple the total momentum before a collision will be equal to the total momentum after a collision provided that there will be no external resulting force acting on that system so if you have a collision before collision momentum is basically the product of mass so momentum is basically the product of mass and velocity so it means that the product the sum of all the product and mass uh, before the collision will be equal to the product of the mass and the velocity after collision the only condition there must be no external resulting force that you have applied into the system okay part b the propulsion system of a toy car so you have a toy car little nice car consists of a propeller attached to an electric motor okay as illustrated here the car is on a horizontal ground and is initially held at rest by its brakes when the toy car is switched on it rotates um so that the propeller you know um so that the air is propelled to the to the left the density of the air 1.3 assume that the air moves with a speed of 1.8 um, in a uniform cylinder of radius 0 0.45 also assume that the air to the right of the propeller is stationary show that in a time interval of 2 the mass of the air propelled to the left is 0 0.3 uh, 0 okay what do we know so imagine these guys the propeller is going to rotate right then it's going to create this sort of a cylinder right the cylinder situation that is going on here because as the propeller is rotating is creating a shape like this right so the propeller is, is creating this sort of cylinder uh, shape that will be going on here as it will be rotating 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 so we want to show that the mass um, of the air rotated to the left is actually 0 0.30 so we can actually find the volume of this little thing here right so we know that for a cylinder The volume is actually pi r squared h that is how you find the volume pi r squared h so it means that if i'm here if i want to find my mass i know that my density is equal to my mass divided by my volume so my mass will be equal to my density times my volume but my density is 1.3 my volume is um pi r squared h okay then if you look at this you have 1.3 times pi times your radius which is um actually 0 0.045 right squared times the height so we just want to find the height of this propeller so you know that s will be equal to vx times t 
So the height of air that will be moved, if you're moving with a specific velocity over a specific period of time, you're going to travel a certain distance. So the distance that you're going to travel will be equal to your velocity, which will be 1.8 times your time, which will be 2.0. So what you're going to do, you're going to take out your calculator, punch everything all together, and what you're going to get will simply is just going to be um, 0 0.0229022, and that's just 0 0.0302 SF kgs. Uh, very important for you to be thinking of that. Moving on. Calculate the increase in momentum of the mass um, of air in B. Also, we, mo we know that momentum is basically equal to the change in mass and velocity but guys the mass is not changing um right but guys the velocity is not changing let's go let's go and look at this the velocity is just 1.8 the air is just moving at 1.8 but what's changing is the mass of air that is present when the propeller was off there was no air but when the propeller is now on there's this whole mass of air so you have a change in the mass so it basically means that my momentum is contributed by my change in the mass times my velocity. What is my change in mass? Well, my change in mass is 0 0.030. What is my velocity? 1.8. So my increase in momentum would just be 0 0.054. 0 0.054. Okay. The force exerted on this mass of air uh, by the propeller. Guys, even if you didn't know how this question was supposed to be worked out, look at this. There's Newton with a second besides it okay and look at this there's a newton alone guys come on you could have seen that okay what has happened here this second has disappeared so it means that whatever answer i had here i just need to divide it by time so that this s disappears that is essentially what you needed to know right even if you didn't know okay that momentum is this and this and this that's something that you should have um sort of figured out right but essentially i want you to know this guys very important your force is equal to your change in momentum your rate of change in momentum so it's your change in momentum divided by the time it has taken the momentum has changed and it has taken a specific amount of time right so we know that um, we have 0 0.054 divided by the time that we took 2.0 seconds this should give us 0 0.027 so our force 0 0.027 okay okay explain how uh, newton has come again dude you know this is a dream of mine you know newton's third law everywhere he left a legacy this guy right let's give him a round of applause guys um so explain how newton's third law applies to the movement of the car by the propeller right not the movement of the car the movement of the air by the propeller right so when i just explain how newton's third law um works so you should know that newton's third law basically is just um you know the the opposite and equal uh, action reaction uh, law right the sort of decide is body a exerts a force on body b but b exerts an equal but opposite force on uh, body b right if you have never heard of it well in, if you're watching this video either you're sitting down you're lying in your bed or you're standing up those three things you are going to experience newton's third law why because if you're sitting on a chair you're going to exert a force on the chair the reason why you're not falling down to the ground is because the chair is exerting an equal force on you. So you're essentially using Newton's third law to watch my video, right? If you're watching this standing somewhere, right, you're stepping on the ground. The ground is exerting an equal but opposite force on you so that you can be able to stand and watch my video. If you're watching my video in your bed, you're literally just lying in your bed. You're exerting an entire force on your bed. The reason why you're not, you know, breaking your entire bed is because your bed is exerting an equal but opposite force to uplift you right so we should thank newton if it wasn't for newton's discovery you probably you know wouldn't be watching my video right now you burn the ground or something right um so we just want to explain the movement of the air by the propeller so what this means is that the force that the air exists on the propeller so the air will sort of push the propeller but the propeller will also push the air and those those two forces would therefore be equal i mean magnitude but opposite in direction right so what we're just going to say is that the force the force on air by a propeller okay so the force that is acting on the air by the propeller is equal to the force 
on the propeller by the air and opposite in direction so if you're going to think about this guys i want you to make a general claim here is that if you have a specific force that is acting in a specific direction it's going to be equal um, to the other force so in every question you're going to be given two things right whenever they ask you about newton's law body a and body b identify what those two things are in order for you to get those two marks every question that asks you for newton's law say it state that one thing exerts a force on the other thing and that's equal to the force that that thing exerts on this thing right so if body a exerts a force on body b it must be equal to the force that body b exerts on body a then they must be also opposite in direction then you'll be done uh, move on to question IV. The total mass of the car is 0 0.2 kgs. Okay. The brakes of the car are released and the car begins to move with an initial acceleration of 0 0.75. Determine the initial frictional force acting on the car. Right. Where um, the toy car. Okay. So we know that the resultant force, right? Basically, the resultant force is equal to your mass times your acceleration. What is your mass? 0 0.20 what is your acceleration 0 0.075 what is your resultant force well um that's going to be 0 0.015 uh, newtons okay um then we know that this is the frictional force okay so if we have a car right if we have our toy car which will be over here this is our car Right, we know that the frictional force is going to oppose the motion, so the frictional force is going to act in this direction. Right, so this is going to be your frictional force, okay? But the thrust, the car is going to move in this direction. Why? Because the air is going to push the car, the propeller is going to propel the car forward. Is even if the propeller is also being pushed, uh, it's also pushing the air, the air is going to push the propeller. So here we're going to have the force of that we've calculated here right this force exerted on this mass of the air by the propeller because the air is going to exert that same force on the propeller itself so force of uh 0 0.027 right so it basically means that if my resultant force is 0 0.15 my resultant force is basically going to be uh, equal to so my frictional force Would just be equal if i have 0 0.027 and the resultant is 0 0.015 how much is actually being contributed by the force of friction that would just be 0 0.012 so here i have 0 0.012 okay very important for you to be thinking of that question four explain what is meant by a longitudinal wave by direction uh, by reference to direction propagation of energy okay this is a uh, simple and uh, a longitudinal wave uh, the vibration to um, the direction of propagation propagation of energy okay very important for you to be thinking of that uh, B essentially sound wave in the air has an amplitude of A what is amplitude you know before you even go into these questions ask yourself what do you even know about amplitude right right the more you know the better you do right so if i'm going to look at this um if i have a line like so okay if i have a line like so okay let's 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 look at this right okay this is not working um if i have a line like this okay if i'm gonna have a wave here my wave is going to be like so okay like so like so like so right so i'm going to have a specific wave which will be like this right and i think i can do it much better um so you're going to have a wave like so okay so this guys is what you call the amplitude from here okay up to here this is essentially the amplitude the maximum height that this thing is going to achieve is essentially just your amplitude so this height here 
So this right here is essentially your amplitude, the maximum height from the equilibrium position. Okay, this will be your amplitude. So the wave has that amplitude A, and then the detector is used to determine A squared. So we are not now detecting A, we're actually detecting A squared. Okay, if you look at this, let's assume this is 2. I just want you to assume this is 2. Okay, this, guys, is essentially just negative A by virtue, right? It has to be negative A. So it means that to go from here to here, right, this is going to be negative A. Okay, so if this is negative 2, right, and this is 2, it means that here I'm going to have 0. So if I'm, I was going to plot A squared, if I have a 2, A squared is going to be 4. So this is going to be a maximum that's going to have a 4. Like so. If I have negative 2, negative 2 squared is what? Is also 4. I'm going to have another maximum that will be there. If I have a 0, 0 is just going to be 0. Right? So if I'm looking at this graph, what it tells me is that wherever I have a 4, that's over here, on this graph, this is representing that 4. Because here, it's going to be 2. And then if I go down and down to 0, this is actually 0. Right? Then if I go up and up and up to negative 2, negative 2 squared is actually 4 again. So it means that from here to here is actually from crest to trough. Okay? I hope that makes sense. Because if it's A squared, if you have negative 2, negative 2 squared is 4. If you have 2, 2 squared is 4. Right? So it means that on this graph, that's going to be the situation that's going here. So your wavelength will essentially be, let's say here, at this 4, we have 25. So at this 4, we have 25. At this uh, f um, here, we have 50. At this here, we have 50. Right? So it means that the next one here will be 75. So lambda, right, is going to be 75 minus 25. Right? 75 minus 25. And your lambda is going to be 50. Right? Because get this, guys. The squared, the squared changes the meaning. Don't just interpret this graph as it is. Look at the axis. What are the axes telling you? And whatever the x tell you, that will help you. Right? So, I've been asked to find the phase difference. What do I know? I know that lambda will be equal to 360 times x divided by lambda. That's the formula to find the phase difference. How much one wave or one point legs behind another. So, in this case, we have... Uh, 360 times the difference between two this this is at 25 this is at 50 so the difference is actually 25 divided by the wavelength which is 50 so this is just one half of 360 which is just 180 degrees so our answer will be 180 does that make sense so the a squared means that one trough or one crest here and the other crest there that those are essentially the exact same if you look at this these are the exact same point okay because this point if you look at this and this this is a crest right this is a trough this is a trough this is a crest because if the crest will still have a positive there's no negative guys on this graph because a squared is always just a positive answer hope it makes sense if you have any questions put them in the comment section i'll be happy to answer them uh moving on the speed of sound in air is 330. Determine the frequency of the sound wave. What do we know? V is equal to F lambda. So F will be equal to V divided by lambda. Your V in this case, 330. Your lambda, 50 times 10 to the power of negative 2. So 330 divided by 50 times 10 to the power of negative 2. That will essentially give you 660 hertz. 660 hertz. Okay, determine the ratio of the amplitude of wave at x is equals to 20 and at x is equals to 25. So we know that a squared, a squared at 20 will be equal to a squared at 25 will also be equal to, let's go on our graph. At 25, this is 25, um, our x is, our a squared is 4, right? So our a squared is 4.0. At, um, sorry, at 25, right? That's when our a squared is 4.0. So here, okay. At 20, at 20 is over here. Um, here we have 2, 2.2, 2.4, that's 2.6. So here we'll have 
8.6 so it means that if i want to find this ratio it's going to be a20 divided by a25 which would be the square root of 2.6 divided by the square root of 4 essentially right so the square root of 26 divided by the square root of 4 which would just be the square root of 2.6 over 4 if you punch that in your calculator that's going to give you about 0 0.8122 sf okay what is cambridge looking for they're looking for the readings on this graph right if you can give them these readings they give you a mark give them an answer they give me a, uh they give you another mark so you have to look at the a squared at 20 the a squared at 25 then find the square roots of those to get the a20 as well as the a25 question uh, five red light of wavelength 6 a 40 is incident normally on a diffraction grating very very important r2 we're having a line spacing of 1.7 as shown the second order diffraction um, maximum is at an angle theta to the direction of the incident light show that theta is 49 degrees whenever you see the word diffraction grating one thing should come to mind d sine theta okay that's the only thing that should come to your mind right um is equal to n lambda this formula guys very important right where okay i'm just going to define it here where d is basically the line spacing so a diffraction gating consists of multiple fine lines right so that light can enter and is diffracted so the spacing of one line is basically your value of d then your theta is your angle okay your angle between any order okay and the zero order right so you're gonna have the zero order which will be here right so your theta can be any angle this is your theta but you must always start from the zero order right and, and you can go in both directions for the first order this will be your theta so the theta is always measured guys always measured from the zero order okay your n is basically that order itself right if it's two theta is from that order of two to go to the zero order right and then your lambda is basically just your wavelength okay your lambda is essentially just your wavelength right so if we now have defined everything so our theta right our theta will now be equal to um arc sine of n lambda divided by d okay so this is going to be um arc sine of n lambda our n in this case uh, is two because it's the second order diffraction two times our lambda if we look at it um 1.7 times 10 to the power of negative um no no it's 640 uh, 640 nanometers right so it's 640 times 10 to the power of negative 9 divided by the value of d 1.7 okay 1.7 times 10 to the power of negative 6 like so you punch this on your calculator your angle theta will end up being uh forty eight point eight four five seven this will just simply be forty nine degrees okay so what is Cambridge looking for Cambridge is very specific it's looking for a student who knows the formula give them a formula they give you a mark guys never leave the formula out never never repeat that mistake right so here they give you a mark you give them a waking right especially the value of lambda knowing what the value of lambda actually is they give you a mark you give them an answer they give you another mark okay determine a different wavelength of visible light that will also produce a diffraction maximum at an angle of 49 degrees okay 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 um what do we know what do we know um we know that okay for visible light right if you're to open your cambridge syllabus um visible light actually lies from 400 to 700 nanometers and this is from your official cambridge test book so we want to find a different wavelength of visible light that will also produce the same diffraction maximum at an angle of 49 degrees 
it's very important noting that there can be different wavelengths if a wavelength is very very small it's going to diffract less right so it's going to have a higher order that's going to be um maybe, maybe let's say it order three is going to match with order two of the other wave right because it's going to have a higher uh, it's going to have a lower wavelength right if it is a higher wavelength then maybe at order one it will produce the same angle as another uh, different wave of light right so essentially since i know that d uh sine theta will be equal to n lambda right like i've said for this one i did uh, i did lambda or i did an n of two okay um so it means that in this case i can do trial and error right and say okay if i have an n of three for this specific wave what would be the value of lambda okay or if n n one and n of three and n of that right so if you do for one you're going to get a very big answer which will not fit 400 to 700 which you can try that out uh, and then if you're going to do for three it means that d sine theta will be equal to three lambda so the value of lambda will be equal to uh d sine theta divided by three and d doesn't change guys it's still going to be 1.7 times 10 to the power of negative six your angle sine of 49 is the exact same angle that we actually need divided by three and this will give you um 4.3 times 10 to the power of negative seven meters and this indeed fits in this range right so your answer will be 4.3 times 10 to the power of negative 7. you're going to get a different answer let's assume i used 4 when i used 4 i got a lambda of uh, 3.20 times 2 to the power of negative 7 and this is way way less than this answer so it means that a very small wavelength with a wavelength of 3.2 should be able to diffract and produce the same thing but only at n is goes to 4. that's when it's going to have the same angle of 49 degrees right 6a define a volt whenever a question asks you to define a unit i repeat <laughs> whenever a question asks you to define a unit you should be happy right pray to whoever you pray to right and be happy because Defining a unit is one of the easiest things in A-level physics. Why? You just go to your formula. For volt, volt is usually for potential difference, right? I know that potential difference is basically the work done per unit charge. Okay, the work done per unit charge. And what you do is you say the unit of volt is what? Uh, of PD is the volt, right? Okay, the units of work done is the jaw. The units of charge is the column. Right, the Colomb, um, you know, spellings are pretty difficult. Uh, let's see, uh, C O uh, C O U, uh, let's see, L O M B. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so the units for the volt will be equal to work done per unit charge. So it's the units of work is the joule, the units for the charge is the Coulomb, and that's it. So you just say the joule per Coulomb, that's it. So you just have to have an equation whenever they ask you to define a specific unit. Then once you have that equation, you'd figure out what are the units of the variables in that equation. In this case, it was the joule for the work done, then the coulomb for the charge. So the joule per coulomb. Okay. We're given a battery, right, of electromotive force 7. The uh, 7 just refers to the amount of, you know, energy that is going to give to each and every charge that passes through it. Connected in series uh, with three components. Series is very, very important um, because in series, we know that charge, okay, or rather current, is actually constant. And this is effect. Okay? Um, so if you are given this and this and this and this, calculate the current and the second I. Okay, so effect that we know. We know that EMF, okay, will be equal to IRZ, right? Because EMF is going to distribute. It distributes IR because V is going to IR, guys, from Ohm's law, right? Plus IRY plus IRX. What is your EMF? Your EMF is 7. What is your I? You don't know. You just want to find out. In RZ, we're already given IRZ, which is the voltage, which is 1.4. So we don't need to put anything here. It will just be 1.4 plus your I, guys. 
uh, for y it's 6 plus your i guys for x it's 5.2 i okay and then if you subtract uh, 7 with 1.4 you're gonna get 5.6 okay then if you add these two up you're gonna get 11.2 uh, i therefore your value of i will just be equal to 5.6 divided by 11.2 5.6 divided by 11.2 basically gives you 0 0.50 um, amps so your current 0.50 um, amps so what are we supposed to know well this entire formula you get a mark okay you give me a correct answer i give you a mark right so essentially what you're supposed to know is that the emf is distributed right because in a series or uh, in a series connection the voltage is shared until we return back so the voltage that we had to begin with that is the emf will be given to z some will be used to overcome y some will be used to overcome x and the voltage is ir so ir z plus ir y plus ir x then we can be able to find the value of i just simple um substitution Calculate the resistance of resistor X. We know that, like I've said, V is equal to IR. So it means that if you want to find RZ, RZ is going to be equal to V divided by I. But the V for RZ is actually 1.4. Then the I is actually um, 0 0.50. So this is going to give you 2.8 um, ohms. 2.8 ohms. Calculate the percentage efficiency with which the battery supplies power to the lamp. What is efficiency? Basically, that is the question that is coming to mind. Efficiency is pretty simple. As a student, you're reading, right? You're studying for your exams, your AS, your A2, um, your exams, um, any exam that you're studying for. You're going to put in an input, right? You're going to sit down. You're going to be studying so that you can be able to pass that big exam, right? Essentially, what you're doing is you're doing work. You're, you're using your power you're inputting your power right but then you're gonna get your results out right when you're receiving your results you're either gonna pass or, or you know you're obviously gonna pass if you're studying physics right um so essentially your efficiency is basically how much work did you get out versus as a student how much work did you put in that is essentially what efficiency is and when it comes to electricity it's basically still the same thing if you have a battery your battery is going to supply energy in right or power input and then you're going to get something out energy output right so it means that the power in the lamp in this case um it will be the power out divided by the power in times 100 percent right and then if you know anything you know that power right and then you know that power is equals to work done divided by uh time but your voltage is equal to your work done per unit charge so your work done will be equal to uh, vq so your power will be equal to uh, vq divided by t right but q is equal to it so q over t is i so um this will be equal to vi so your power will be equal to vi but your power is also equal to i squared r because v is equal to ir so you can substitute right so because i know that i know that my power in will just be essentially how much so my power in is coming from the battery Right? And I'm going to use VI with uh, this is my EMF times my current I. Okay. My EMF uh, being 7.0. Then my I being 0 0.50. So it means that I'm going to get 3.5 watts. The battery is giving me a power of 3.5 watts. But what am I actually getting out? That's my power out. This would be equal to I squared R, which would be equal to your I. 0 0.50 squared for the uh, lamp the current is actually 6.0 so it means that this should give you your efficiency so your efficiency will just be your power out 0 0.50 squared times 6.0 divided by 3.5 times 100 and this should give you you know 42.85714 which would just be uh, 43 percent so efficiency would just be 43 percent right what is cambridge looking for i always want this question right what is cambridge actually looking for in a student well they're looking for a student who can give them 
accurate formulas guys give formulas please um so for giving these formulas you get a mark for correct computation you get a mark then for your answer you get a mark so ask yourself what is the power you're getting out what is the power you have put in and how do you find that ratio moving on the filament uh, lamp is made up of metal of resistivity 3.7 times 10 to the power of negative uh, 7 determine for the filament lamp uh, the value of lambda where lambda is the cross-sectional area divided by the length so what do you know you know that r as a student r is equal to rho l divided by a so it means that r times a will be equal to rho times l so it means that a over l will be equal to rho over r but i know that as a student lambda is actually equal to a over l therefore my value of lambda is just my resistivity divided by my resistance right uh, my resistivity 3.7 times 10 to the power of negative 7 my uh, resistance is actually 6.0 okay so it means that i'm going to get an answer 6.16666 times uh, 10 to the power of negative 8 10 to the power of negative 8 and then this is going to give you 6.2 times 10 to the power of negative 8 meters okay 6.2 times 10 to the power of negative 8 right moving on the current in a metal wire we're given a metal wire and the current is given by this expression state what is meant by the symbols a and n so i is goes to n a v e is used to find the current in a current carrying conductor a just refers to the cross the cross sectional area the cross sectional area of the wire okay and n just refers to the number density okay the number density not just the number density guys come on be fancy the number density of a free electrons so them you know you've learned some physics you've learned how to redefine physics right so the number density of free electrons so you have the a representing the cross-sectional area of the wire the n representing the number density of free electrons right number density meaning right number density being how much number of electrons do you have per unit volume that's basically number density right um, you know physics really asks you to find number density they usually give you the number density but think of it as the number of electrons that you have per unit uh, volume b the diameter of a wire xy varies linearly uh, with uh, distance along the wire as shown in fig 7.1 so they give me this we have specific current i that is entering into this system okay and then uh d here and then d over 2 which is over here sure there's current i in the wire at the end of the wire the diameter is actually d and the drift velocity is actually uh, vx so we have a diameter d vx at the end of the wire y the diameter is d over 2 sketch a graph okay graphs are very fun i want you to tell you guys something because with graphs find a relationship essentially by the virtue of just finding a relationship you have passed the graph question right so if you look at this um you're starting at x with the velocity of vx right so you're gonna go at x and then you're gonna plot your little point here okay like so but you don't know it why now what, what, what are you gonna do what are you gonna do so you go back to your equations that's why physics questions always go back to the first question and see how huh, they gave me that equation i can probably use that equation to figure something out right so what do we know and what can we find out so let's let's get to it i know that right to start off i know that i is equal to a n r v e right and then i know that my i is actually constant because that whole thing is actually in series and i know my number density is actually constant the number of electrons that are flowing will not change guys because the thickness has changed because the diameter has changed no and then your elementary charge is actually just going to be constant so you're going to have a variation between a and v a very very important variation so you're going to have a is inversely proportional to one over v right so the area is going to be inversely proportional to one over v but guys you know that your area is actually pi d squared over four so you can substitute that you have pi d squared over four 
inversely proportional to 1 over v but pi over 4 is just constants right so we can remove them and say d squared is that proportional to 1 over v therefore to remove the proportionality sign you introduce a constant d squared will be equal to k over v but in this case because d is where we're starting with is v over x okay so at y i have d over 2 now you just substitute right so you just go and then we start off at y at y i have d over 2 all of that squared being equivalent to k over vy right that's what i want to find so here i have d squared over 4 being equivalent to k over vy so if i multiply both sides so i'll have uh, my vy being equal to okay my vy being equal to um 4k over d squared right but if i go here if i go here if you look at this your vx is essentially just k over d squared basically then if you look here i have 4k over d squared right so it means that your vy will actually be four times vx <coughs> which is actually true they're gonna move faster with four times the initial velocity so with 4x and how did i figure this out i started by creating relationships introducing constants then making substitution this is the easiest way that you can think of this or you can just go here and say if you have this by two right it means if you have this that means that it reduces by a factor of a quarter so one over v will in, uh, increase by four but i would really encourage you to use equations they are much easier to understand in my own opinion we can argue otherwise but in my own opinion i think they're much quite easier to understand so it's why we're going to have four x it's why we're going to have four x but we don't know guys it's going to be a line like this it's going to be a line like this we don't know it's going to be a line like this we don't know so what do you do in that case because the last mark the one mark is a line just that is drawn between these two points so a line between uh, these two points but then the other mark is for the shape which is the gradient they need an increasing gradient so what you do is you go in the middle right you go to the middle here if you find this coordinate if it's here then it's a straight line right if it's here then it's a kf that's going up if it's down here then it's a kf that's going down okay so we're gonna go at the midpoint right and then once uh, we find that we're gonna have right so it's at at the midpoint and you know this guys the midpoint of one and half is actually three quarter right because three quarter is in the upper half so we're gonna have three d over four all of that squared being equal to k over vm the mid right so here we're gonna have 9 d squared over 16 being equal to k over vm so vm is just going to be 16 over 9 k over d squared so your velocity at the middle will just be 16 over 9 if you punch that in your calculator is going to be 1.7 okay if you punch that on a calculator that's going to be 1.777 uh, going on and on and on right uh v x okay so if i'm going to go here it means that at my middle point here i'm going to have 1.7 so if i go here 1.1234567 1 so it's going to be here Uh -huh. and if you look at this it's actually not in the same line as that line that's supposed to be here so what it means is that it's going to be a line like so okay like so right it's a little bit crooked but that's essentially what you need and this is what we call increasing gradient right it's actually a line with increasing gradient because the gradient is actually increases the gradient which is here is way different from the gradient which is over here the gradient is actually increasing so it's a line with increasing gradient okay um moving on so that's how we think about graphs find relationships then plot the graph it's too much work for two marks i know right but that's physics right we physicists are not lazy they are willing to do the hard work where other people fail to right so don't be lazy as a physicist just understand that 
it's a pretty pretty fun but complicated subject right and Under, underline all particles that are leptons um we have anti-neutrino and we have a um and a neutron and what and a positron right a quark is not a lepton because the lepton is basically force which is not f anything that's not found in the nucleus essentially nucleus of magnesium 27 decays by emitting a beta negative particle and gamma radiation and a complete equation is shown instead the nuclear number and the proton number of nucleus x okay the nuclear number doesn't change during beta negative decay so it's just going to be 27 okay so we're just going to have 27 um the proton number however since beta is a negative one and beta negative means that a neutron is actually turned into a proton so you're gonna have one more proton so you're gonna have 13 protons instead the name of the interaction that gives rise to this decay well um it's actually called the weak nuclear interaction or the weak nuclear force and i'm going to explain why that is so it's called the weak uh nuclear force or the weak nuclear attraction now this is not in your syllabus to discuss about the four fundamental forces that exist in the universe but i don't think you know as a human being it's fair for you to exist on planet earth without knowing the forces that are acting on you right or so the forces that are acting on the universe right so you know i would really like you to just appreciate the forces that we find which are four of them right number one being the force of gravity right a lot of big men that have worked on the force of gravity we have the strong nuclear force we have the weak nuclear force found in the nucleus then we have the um, um the electromagnetic force so the four big uh, the big four the big forces that are acting on this universe that you're on right now now these four forces are very 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 important because they have different purposes in life right and the nucleus really force of gravity is insignificant really doesn't play a big role electromagnetic force yes it does right but the biggest interaction that gives rise to beta negative decay is actually the weak nuclear force or the weak nuclear attraction the strong nuclear attraction just binds things inside the nucleus the weak nuclear force is actually responsible for this decay process right how um again it's not in the syllabus so i won't go in depth i would actually confuse you more but essentially what it does is it converts a down quark into an up quark right and how does it do this it causes an exchange of w bosons um again <laughs> this is you know complicated stuff but I just want you to know this lock in right there are a lot of things that you have to understand when you get to university or you you get to different courses in quantum mechanics if you like it right they, that's where they will just explain what are w bosons what are higgs bosons and all those stuff but essentially just know that the exchange um between uh those bosons can result in a down quark changing into an up quark and what you only need to know at AS is that the force that gives right to beta negative decay is the weak nuclear force you're done okay you'll be done state two possible reasons why the sum of the kinetic energy of b negative and the energy of y uh, is actually less than the total energy released during the decay so the energy that is in the beta minus particle and the energy that the gamma gain is not even equal to the energy that is released why because x has kinetic energy right x has kinetic energy it's gonna move so it's gonna take in other words they're telling where, where is some of this energy going so x has kinetic energy and it moves with it now this is me just being a little bit extra i don't know why i do this at times right um and then two um what else has been released we've produced an electron neutrino right because um electron an electron anti-neutrino during beta negative decay right so an electron so we have an electron anti-neutrino that is released and this has some of its energy x has some of the kinetic energy it moves away with it and then some of the energy goes to the beta negative particle and some of the energy is taken by the gamma radiation um moving on to the next qu uh, we're done right uh, that's that's pretty interesting um so thank you guys for watching this video i hope it was really helpful in gaining uh in helping you gain insights on how you're supposed to tackle some of these physics questions again physics is about application guys if you're if you're gonna rely on just you know pure knowledge that you're just getting from a textbook or from your class it's gonna be pretty tough because look at this concept this is a concept that you don't see in any textbook like what we did here right this is a concept that you have to read 
and you have to do a lot of past papers go on youtube watch a lot of videos um do a lot of practice papers to get exposure to these kind of questions if this question comes in your exam you'll be able to answer it so the more questions you do the more exposure that you have and if you made it this far you probably like the video please do subscribe please come on um you know and help this channel grow and reach more people again thank you guys for watching and i'll see you in, and i'll see you in the next one